This show is sponsored by BetterHelp Online Therapy. With so much going on in life, sometimes we put ourselves last and that can take its toll. Visit betterhelp.com super and make your happiness a priority. Hey brother. What if Harry Potter was sorted into Slytherin? This is the question we've been pursuing on this channel for the past two weeks, and today we continue that journey into The Prisoner of Azkaban. If you'd like to get fully caught up, you can start here, but thus far the journey has been wild, and whilst Harry has stayed true to his Voldemort-hating self, there have been several big changes. Namely, Harry has now embraced what it truly means to be a Slytherin and proven that he is a true Slytherin by controlling the Basilisk last year, which is still alive, by the way. Ron is also now the seeker for the Gryffindor Quidditch team, Draco is the one who got pulled into the chamber instead of Ginny, and Slytherin has won the House Cup nine years in a row. But Prisoner is the book where the past starts catching up with the present. I mean, quite literally in some cases with the time turner, but more specifically with Peter, Lupin, and Sirius. But will the fact that Harry was sorted differently affect how they treat him? And will Fred and George still give him the Marauder's Map? Today, we find out. Guys, real quick, I just want to take a moment to tell you guys about Carlin Brothers Coffee Common Room Candles. In case you didn't know, yes, we have our own coffee brand, and yes, that coffee brand includes candles. We've actually been doing something really fun each quarter where we release a new magically inspired candle that smells amazing. This is actually our latest one and it's called Common Room Green. It has wonderfully musky notes of tobacco, charred parchment, and leather. I've been burning the green ones at my house all week and they seriously just make you want to settle into a big leather chair with a hardback book and a tasty drink. Plus, and this is super fun, at the bottom of each of the candles after you melt all the wax away, there is a limited edition exclusive charm you can collect from each common room candle. If you want to get your hands on one of these, you can head over to carlinbrotherscoffee.com. There is a link in the description down below for the green one, but also we have lots of other good stuff on there like honey and coffee and tea and mugs and you know, there's a lot, just check it out. One more time, that's carlinbrotherscoffee.com. Link in the description down below. If you want one of the green ones, go fast before they sell out. Okay, so as ever, we start off with Harry back at the Dursleys. And as you may expect, Harry being in Slytherin doesn't really affect much here. Except, I don't know, maybe at this point, Harry just like openly communicates with garden snakes to go bother Dudley. Actually, yeah, let's just go ahead and assume that happens because it doesn't really affect anything and it's kind of hilarious. But otherwise, Harry still needs the Dursleys to sign his permission slip into Hogsmeade and they still require him to behave in front of Aunt Marge in order for them to do so, which Harry simply cannot do. He still inflates her, still runs away, and Sirius still shows up and scares him into accidentally summoning the Knight bus. And yes, I think Sirius still pretty much escapes as usual. The Weasleys still win the daily draw and take a trip to Egypt and get in the paper for it. And Sirius still sees the picture of Peter and that's why he escapes. And Harry still arrives in Diagon Alley a few weeks early and spends his time window shopping and longing after the firebolt. The Weasleys still show up, as does Hermione, and Scabbers is still looking sick because obviously Sirius escaped, so they still go to the Magical Menagerie and Hermione still gets Crookshanks. Really, the first big change doesn't happen until the train ride to school. Harry and friends still end up in a train car with Lupin, who's as asleep as ever, but then the Dementors come to search the train. And we all know what happens next. Harry singularly passes out being affected that much more by the Dementors. But in this scenario, there is one other student on the train who has recently suffered a terribly traumatic event and who I think also passes out. Draco. Who, if you will recall, in the last video was the one who was abducted by Tom Riddle and brought to the Chamber of Secrets where he was nearly killed. And yes, I hear what you're saying. Uh, yeah, but Jay, didn't the same thing happen to Ginny in the main storyline and she didn't pass out? True, but not for nothing. I kind of feel like Ginny is, I don't know, how do you say, made of stronger stuff than Malfoy. I mean, Draco is barely keeping it together in book six under threat of death as a 16 year old. In this scenario, he was practically killed not three months ago as a 12 year old. Ah, uh, yeah, but but Harry passes out and certainly he, he's made of the strongest stuff, right? I mean, com comes back to life at the end and everything. That's pretty good. And that's also true, but I also think maybe Harry's trauma is just like a touch worse than Malfoy's, by which I mean a lot worse. Like his parents were brutally murdered in front of him as a one-year-old. So yes, 
Harry and Draco both pass out. Unlike Harry though, Draco is not in Lupin's compartment and therefore does not benefit from his chocolate-based expertise, nor is he sent to the hospital wing when they arrive at school. Instead, he just wakes up on the train, afraid, cold, and embarrassed. And I think when they get to school, he does still actually ask Harry the same question. Is it true you fainted? The difference is this time he's asking out of solidarity rather than in jest. But I think in the moment, Harry doesn't quite realize that. Harry and Draco find themselves on pretty unusual ground this year with Harry having saved Draco's life last year and Draco having freed Dobby at Harry's request. So as of now, I don't think they necessarily like each other, but that's almost more out of habit at this point. Instead, they have more of like a mutual respect between them with Draco also suffering some sort of internal battle about whether or not he actually agrees with his family's beliefs. On the first day of classes, Harry's does go down a little bit differently. Obviously, he doesn't have divination with the Gryffindors, but instead with the Slytherins. But I don't really think that changes too much. Trelawney's still going to see the Grimm in his tea leaves almost no matter what, because she's almost no matter what just making it up. And we all know she just likes to be dramatic, and she's not like ignorant about who Harry Potter is. Harry being in Slytherin actually does not affect when he has care of magical creatures, though, because they have it at the same time as the Gryffindors. Hagrid is, of course, the new care of magical creatures teachers this year, and as ever, he is showing off hippogriffs on his very first day, and as usual, Harry is the brave one who rides Buckbeak. But the main difference is, again, Malfoy, who usually provokes Buckbeak and gets slashed in the arm and sets in motion this entire plot where Hagrid is on trial and unsure about whether he's a good teacher and Buckbeak might get executed. It's also the reason Marcus Flynn reschedules the first Quidditch match so that Draco's arm can heal. But with Draco being a lot more indifferent towards Harry this year, I don't think he puts on the act. And thus, Hagrid's class kind of just goes off without a hitch. Speaking of Quidditch, though, we have yet another change. And guess who it is again? Malfoy, who is now finally back on the Slytherin team. He's of course normally already on the team by now, but this time Harry's the seeker, so Malfoy didn't actually make the team in his second year. But third year is when Slytherin picks up some new chasers, and I do think Malfoy would land one of those spots. I mean, he after all is a really good flyer. Ah, but so then you might be wondering, does Lucius Malfoy still buy the rest of the team brand new Nimbus 2001s like he does in Chamber? And the answer is no, and the reason is because Harry's on the team. And Lucius is definitely still mad at Harry for Dobby, so instead, he he just buys Draco a new broom, and you guessed it, the Firebolt. And it's really a very Lucius Malfoy kind of move. I mean, it looks like he's being supportive of Harry because Harry is on the team, but really it's meant to just make Draco overshadow him. Anyway, though, that brings us to a different first lesson, Defense Against the Dark Arts, which is a pivotal lesson. This is the one where everyone fights the Bogard. It's where Hermione first notices that Lupin is afraid of the moon and where Lupin stops Harry from interacting with the Bogart because he's afraid Voldemort's gonna show up. However, this year, Harry is not in the Gryffindor class. He has Defense Against the Dark Arts, with the Slytherins. And now you might be pointing out, uh, don't the Gryffindors end the class by defeating the Bogarts? So would the Slytherins have even had a chance to fight it in their class? And I think the answer is yes. Lupin says in the main storyline, I asked the headmaster if the staff would leave it to give my third year some practice. He says third years, not third year Gryffindor. So presumably Gryffindor is just the last house to have the class and as such are allowed to finish it off. I mean, Lupin certainly does seem like the kind of teacher that would be fair to all of the houses anyway, right? Especially if Harry is in Slytherin. But this is fun. It means we get to see all of the Slytherin's bogarts, like Crabbe and Goyle presumably see tables devoid of any food. Hansi Parkinson is presented with a mirror. Millicent Bolstrode just sees a hairbrush. And Draco sees, to Harry's shock, a Dementor. This is the very thing Harry himself was afraid of seeing, and it's here where Lupin actually has to step in, the Dementor being too much for Draco to handle. It does mean he reveals his fear of the moon to the class again for anyone who's willing to notice, and that Harry, once more, doesn't get to have a turn. Harry does decide to talk to Draco about the Dementor, though, and admits that's the same thing he was afraid of seeing, and Draco admits that's why he asked Harry if he had also fainted because of the Dementor on the train, because he fainted too. But that brings us to Halloween, which as usual is a very interesting day in the Harry Potter books. For everyone else, it is their first trip to Hogsmeade of the year. Harry goes to Snape to try and appeal for some favoritism to see if he can go, but he also says no for the same reasons McGonagall does in the main storyline. But one thing that doesn't change is what happens after the feast. 
Sirius Black attacks the fat lady. And this is kind of an odd one because in the main storyline, this basically confirms everyone's worst fear that Sirius is hunting Harry because he attacks his common room and somewhat violently. However, this time around, Harry isn't in Gryffindor. So what does everyone make of it? Honestly, I don't think it changes that much. Like we all know that Sirius is actually hunting Pettigrew and that's the reason he attacked Gryffindor Tower. But anyone in story doesn't actually know that except Crookshanks. Otherwise though, I think everyone would assume that Sirius attacked Gryffindor Tower because that's where he guessed Harry would be because that's where both of Harry's parents were. And as a result, Harry would feel that much more grateful for having been in Slytherin and the extra layer of defense it bought him. But with Halloween out of the way, that brings us to the first Quidditch match of the year, Slytherin versus Gryffindor. Now in the main story, it's Gryffindor versus Hufflepuff, but that's because Flint has the schedule changed so Draco's arm can heal from the Buckbeak attack. But that didn't happen this time, so instead we're kicking things off with the big rematch, Slytherin versus Gryffindor, Ron versus Harry and Draco. If you recall, last time Ron actually Actually won the match for Gryffindor, but this time Draco has the fireball, which just completely nullify Wood's strategy of trying to slow Harry down with the bludgers until his chasers can score more. On top of that, it is storming like crazy during this game, which hurts both seekers and really favors Draco, who indeed puts on a show. The Gryffindors are just no match for the fireball. It has truly been a tough match for the Gryffindor. Slytherin is up by 140 points. Draco is scoring like crazy. But then Harry and Ron both spot the snitch and the race is on. As ever, Harry is the better flyer and just playing faster than Ron, but Ron was closer to the snitch when they saw it and has the lead. Meanwhile, Draco has the quaffle again and is heading for a goal. He dodges a bludger, then a chaser, and then the air gets cold. Back at the Seekers, Harry has caught Ron. They are neck and neck. Harry is an inch ahead. They're both reaching for the snitch and suddenly Harry hears his mother's screams in his ears. The Dementors have arrived. Draco winds up to take a shot, but suddenly starts hearing Tom Riddle speaking in his head. Draco loses focus. He loses his grip. He falls. Harry falls. Ron catches the snitch. Gryffindor wins. <laughs> I gotta say, Ron is impressing me here. I mean, he's now 2-0 against Harry in this fictional version of a fictional story. Naturally, everyone thinks Ron is the hero, except Ron, who thinks he only won because of the Dementors. Classic Ron. But that's actually very similar to what Cedric thinks when he wins the match in the main story, which, of course, didn't happen this time. Either way, both Harry and Draco's brooms break. Harry is devastated. Draco is mortified. Wait till his father hears about this. Spoilers, Lucius is not going to be happy. After the match, Harry still talks to Lupin about teaching him how to fight Dementors in case they show up at another Quidditch match and Lupin agrees to do so after the winter break. But before that, there's another trip to Hogsmeade, which of course Harry is left behind for again, but not for long because Fred and George show up to give him the Marauders map. Now, to be fair, Slytherin Harry is not quite as tight with Fred and George as he would be in the main storyline. That's for sure. However, Harry did still spend a good chunk of his second summer with the Weasleys. He still defeated Voldemort twice. And now their little brother has beaten him twice at Quidditch from what they might consider to be unfair circumstances, especially since last year it was one of them who knocked him out cold with a bludger. Plus, you know, Fred and George just love to encourage rule breaking wherever they can. So for all of these reasons, I think they still decide to give Harry the Marauders map, which he of course immediately uses to head to Hogsmeade to meet up with Harry and Ron and then get trapped under the table at the Three Broomsticks where he overhears Haggard and McGonagall and Flitwick and Cornelius Fudge you know, a totally normal group of people to be hanging out together, whatever. The point is Harry overhears the apparent truth about Sirius Black, that he was James's best friend and he betrayed them and gave up their location via the Fidelius charm. Exactly the news he was hoping for heading into the holidays, huh? But that does bring us to Christmas where Harry wakes up to discover he's been given a very special gift. A firebolt. The obvious difference being that he discovers this by himself in the Slytherin common room rather than in the Gryffindor common room with Ron and Hermione. But either way, I think he tells them pretty much immediately and Hermione still snitches. Eh? Get it? To McGonagall and or Snape, who then does have to come confiscated from Harry and strip it down to make sure it wasn't like hexed or something. After Christmas, Harry is of course poised to start anti-dementor lessons with Lupin, but I do think one major change happens here and that Harry doesn't go to the lessons by himself. I think instead he invites 
Draco. Draco is, of course, the only other student who is affected by the Dementors as much as Harry. Harry would have seen that Draco's Bogart was also a Dementor, and they both would have fallen off their brooms in the last Quidditch match. And I don't think Draco's troubles end there. Remember, he's coming back from break with his parents, where I don't think Lucius is going to have been too happy that Draco immediately broke the small fortune of a firebolt that he bought him. And let's be honest, if there's anyone who can sympathize with what it's like being mistreated at home, it's Harry. Not to not to mention, as we said earlier, Draco has also been spending this year kind of just wondering whether or not he even agrees with his father's beliefs. So seeing his distraught teammate and being able to uniquely understand the struggles Draco is going through, Harry extends the invite to him to come to anti-dementor lessons with Lupin. Lupin, for his part, of course, allows this to happen and as ever is impressed with Harry's generosity, especially towards someone who was a perceived enemy. The lessons themselves, though, go pretty much the same, each boy kind of struggling to barely produce some silvery mist. But Afterwards, Draco is grateful for the invite and decides to offer Harry a full explanation for why Sirius Black might be hunting him down. Which is information we know he knows from the main story when he's taunting Harry. Maybe you'd rather not risk your neck. Want to leave it to the Dementors, do you? But if it was me, I'd want revenge. I'd hunt him down myself. Harry, of course, learned all this information back in Hogsmeade when he overheard the teachers talking about it, but he listens all the same just to see if there is any new bits of information, which there really isn't. But Harry is surprised to learn that even Draco's father didn't know that Sirius was actually on their side until after the fact, and that Sirius had another brother, Regulus, who was also a Death Eater. But enough about Sirius Black, let's get back to things people actually care about. Quidditch! Next up is Slytherin vs. Ravenclaw, and it's oddly important. Typically this match happens off screen or page or whatever, and all we really know about it is that Slytherin wins, but narrowly. Importantly though, it happens sooner in the year than the Gryffindor Ravenclaw match, meaning that by the time of this match, the teachers haven't actually finished examining Harry's firebolt. So Harry actually won't have his firebolt to face Ravenclaw like he usually does. This is also normally the match where Harry first has any exposure to Cho Chang, the Ravenclaw seeker. However, we also know from the main story that Cho actually only recovers from injury and is cleared to play just before the Gryffindor Ravenclaw match. So she actually will not be playing in this match, which is significant because this is when Harry first develops a crush on her. So Harry will instead be up against the second string Ravenclaw seeker, who's obviously worse than Cho, but Harry is gonna be on a school broom as will Draco. This is of course a lesson from Lucius about not embarrassing him and not costing him money. It's a tough match, but Harry and Draco have a lot to prove. And even though normally Slytherin only wins narrowly with an entire squad full of Nimbus 2001s, I still think they win anyway, because despite their brooms, Harry is just that good at Seeker. Also, obviously Malfoy and friends don't dress up as Dementors to try and spook uh, Harry, so he doesn't have to go down and shoot like the full Patronus at them, but that doesn't really matter because Harry doesn't even realize he shot a full Patronus out, so. Interestingly though, that means that come Gryffindor versus Ravenclaw, it's actually Ron who plays against Cho and loses, by the way, because you know, I dare say he was uh, a little distracted. You know, I like it when they walk. This honestly ends up being a pretty bad day for Ron. Not only does he lose the Quidditch match, but later that night is when Sirius finally manages to break all the way into the Gryffindor common room, having stolen Neville's list of passwords, and wakes Ron up in the middle of the night with the big long knife. Harry is of course relieved to have survived another attack, but now is afraid that Sirius knows for sure he's not in Gryffindor and that that layer of defense is now gone. Anyway though, that brings us to the next Hogsmeade visit, and it is quite pivotal. This is the one where Harry dons the invisibility cloak and goes up to the shrieking shack with Ron and then throws a bunch of mud at Malfoy and Crab and Goyle and then the cloak slips off and Malfoy sees his head. The obvious difference this time though being that Harry and Malfoy are just on much better terms and so Harry doesn't throw the mud and Draco doesn't see him and doesn't go running to Snape. Now, as we know, typically in this situation, Lupin comes in and saves Harry from any punishment, but in doing so, ends up taking the map from Harry. This time, that doesn't happen. Harry just has a regular fun day at Hogsmeade. Woo! But I promise you, the ramifications of Lupin not having the map, 
big. But enough about that. Back to Quidditch. Actually, before we get to Quidditch, I feel obligated to point out that because Buckbeak's not on trial this year, we don't get this wonderful scene. <laughs> oh, oh. In the book, she actually slaps him instead of punching him, but whatever. On the other hand though, without the trial hanging over his head all year, it turns out Hagrid's classes are actually really popular and he's a very good teacher and just shows everyone lots of interesting beasts. But now back to Quidditch and it's the final, Slytherin versus Hufflepuff. And Harry finds himself in much the same position as usual, having lost to Gryffindor, who then went on to lose to Ravenclaw. And it is quite the matchup, you guys. It is Harry Potter versus Cedric Diggory. But this time, Harry has his firebolt back. Oh yeah! Also, unlike his usual match against Hufflepuff, there are no Dementors this time, and it is not raining. And honestly, I wish I could tell you this was some sort of big, dramatic, finale, but it's not. Slytherin just wins by a mile. They are they are just no match for Harry on the fireball. Slytherin easily wins and takes home the cup. Diggory loses. Take that, Amos. And just like that, we are at exams, which for the most part go down the same, except obviously Harry is with the Slytherins instead of the Gryffindors. Which does mean, however, we get to see Draco take on the Defense Against the Dark Arts obstacle course and fight the Bogart at the end, which of course turns into a Dementor, in which Draco defeats by finally producing a fully corporeal Patronus. A peacock. Which, by the way, if you don't think it's a peacock, full video by clicking the card. Harry manages to fend off the Boggart as well, but without producing a fully corporeal Patronus, which makes him equally jealous and impressed by Draco. But then there's divination, which, as we all know, is incredibly important because it is where Trelawney doles out another prophecy. And this one was so curious because the prophecy is the same no matter what, meaning the outcome of the evening has to remain the same pretty much no matter what. But we have a lot of different scenarios in play than usual. So how does it all go down? To refresh you, I'm not gonna read the whole prophecy, but in a nutshell, it just says that Peter will escape and help Voldemort rise to power again. But let's see, Buckbeak isn't in danger like he usually is, and Lupin doesn't have the map, so would the trio even be down at Hagrid's to begin with? Actually, yes, they would. Why? Because Hagrid found Scabbers. Rather than going down to comfort Hagrid over Buckbeak's pending execution, it's just to celebrate. Ron got his rat back. Hermione apologizes to Ron. Ron apologizes to Hermione. Everybody's happy. But as usual, on their way back to the castle, Sirius emerges. He attacks Ron and drags him into the Whomping Willow and up to the Shrieking Shack. Crookshanks, Harry, and Hermione all follow where they discover that Sirius Black is an Animagus. What? It's a trap, he's a dog, he's an Animagus. Now, normally right here, Lupin has the map and he sees Peter on it and immediately rushes down to see what's what. And he arrives just in time, stopping Harry from making a crucial decision about whether or not he's going to kill Sirius. As if Harry even knows any spells that could do that at this age. I mean, <laughs> but Lupin does not have the map this time, so he doesn't show up, which consequently means Snape doesn't show up because he doesn't see the map in Lupin's office a few minutes later. But really, it doesn't matter that much because we all know Harry's going to make the correct decision not to kill. But as Harry falters, Sirius begins to explain the entire situation to him just without Lupin, how he and Peter switched places at the last second, and then how Peter gave up his parents, and Peter framed Sirius. Harry is, of course, intrigued, and the fact that Scabbers is missing a toe and has been living for an exceptionally long time are two big pieces of evidence that Harry just can't ignore. But he's still not sure whether he's fully willing to trust Sirius Black. Certainly, he's not going to give him a wand. But since neither Harry, Ron, nor Hermione know how to force Peter to transform with their own wands, Harry agrees to bring Sirius up to the school to have one of the teachers test this theory. With the understanding that if Sirius is lying, he will hand him over to the Dementors, which Sirius, of course, agrees to because he knows he has the benefit of the truth on his side. So together, everyone makes their way back to the the castle. Harry hides Sirius under the invisibility cloak so no one will be scared by the sight of him, and he pulls out the map to make sure they won't run into anyone anyway. As you're wondering, yes, he still would have had the cloak with him because they would have needed it to get down to Hagrid's because of the increased security because of Black, and he probably would have brought the map with him for the same reasons. But upon seeing the map, Sirius speaks up. You have the map? What do you know about it? I wrote it. I'm Padfoot. Your father was Prongs. Peter was Wormtail. In fact, Look, at which point Harry stares down at the map and sees the proof. Right next to their own dots is a dot for Peter Pettigrew. 
You see? You see, it is him. Harry, Ron, and Hermione look down completely aghast. They almost can't believe their eyes. It is Peter Pettigrew. Peter, on the other hand, realizes that the jig is up, bites Ron on the hand, and makes a run for it. Immobulous! Hermione is too fast. Scabbers is frozen. We still need to prove this is him. We have to transform him. Who was Mooney? Harry asks Sirius. Ah, I haven't seen Mooney in a long time. I doubt you've heard of him, given his condition. His name was Remus. Remus Lupin. Lupin? But he's here. He's a professor. We can take you to him. He can transform Scabbers for us. Hold on, I need smoke from this next part. And so they make their way to Lupin's office. But when they arrive, they open the door to discover a fully transformed werewolf. Pause. Okay, so remember earlier when I said Snape wouldn't show up at the Shrieking Shack because he didn't see the map in Lupin's office? Well, the reason he's in Lupin's office to begin with in the main story is to bring him the Wolf's Bane potion, which normally Lupin fails to drink because he's off at the Shrieking Shack. This time, however, Snape's delivery would have been successful and Lupin would have drank the potion. The effects of which are, it makes me safe, you see, as long as I take it to the weeks preceding the full moon. I keep my mind when I transform. I am able to curl up in my office, a harmless wolf, and wait for the moon to wane again. So yes, Lupin does still transform. He's just not actually dangerous, which is not to say he doesn't still look dangerous. Unpause. Werewolf! Hermione screams. Lupin is of course startled awake. He gets to his wolfy feet and notices Sirius standing in the door, but still doesn't know about Peter and thinks Sirius is still guilty. He's a werewolf, Harry. That's why he's sick every month. I should have noticed the full moon. Lupin, still taking in the situation, takes a step forward out of instinct to protect the kids from Sirius, but this small motion throws everything into panic. Ron screams and drops the still frozen Peter. Lupin lunges at Sirius. Everybody falls down. Sirius manages to transform and force Lupin back into his office. The kids all slam the door shut and magically seal him inside. Sirius then transforms back into a man and tries to plead with Lupin on the other side of the door, unaware that he's actually of sound mind. It was Peter, Remus. It was Peter. I can prove it. We switched places. Then, much to everyone's shock, Lupin actually stops attacking the door. Sirius then has an idea and slides the map under the door. Do you see, Remus? Do you see Peter on the map? Remus the wolf moans in understanding, but then and immediately starts growling. What, what, what's wrong with him? Where's Peter? Sirius shouts. During all the commotion, Peter has recovered from the spell and made a run for it. Sirius sees him at just the last moment, transforms himself, and the chase is on. Harry and Hermione immediately take off after him with Ron limping behind. His ankle was still broken way back at the Whomping Willow. I forgot to say that earlier. Lupin remains locked in his office. Back to the chase, Peter makes it all the way outside the castle before suddenly and unexpectedly transforming into a human, knowing he can't outrun Sirius as a rat. Sirius stops the chase and transforms as well to confront Peter face to face. You must have known I'd come for you, Peter. Is that why you've been in hiding all these years? Or were you afraid the Death Eaters would blame you for Voldemort's downfall? Honestly, I'm surprised you have the courage to face me as a man now. Just stalling for time, he replies. The mentors swoop in in every direction, having noticed Sirius in his human form. Peter transforms again and manages to escape in all of the confusion. The Dementors swarm Sirius. Harry rushes in and tries his best to help, but it's simply no use. He just can't conjure a Patronus strong enough to ward them all off. Until, boom, something bright, white, and antler charges in and chases the Dementors off from just over where Peter just was. Harry and Sirius are saved, but both immediately collapse. And now we come to the time turner in. Page 12 of the script, goodness me. Feels like a good time for some more smoke, am I right? Everybody wakes up in the hospital wing, Ron is injured, and Dumbledore comes in and gets the full explanation of everything that just went down, and suggests to Harry and Hermione that perhaps they can still save Sirius. Turns out he's being held prisoner in one of the towers, being guarded by Professor Snape. They're just awaiting Fudge to arrive with some Dementors to perform the Dementors' kiss. Two hours should be enough, Miss Granger. So Harry and Hermione go back two hours in time, by which Harry is completely confused, but Hermione explains the entire situation to him and how they just cannot be seen. Also, yes, it's only two hours this time because they don't have to save Buckbeak, so they don't need as much time. Also means they don't have to go down to Hagrid's. Instead, they head to the Defense Against the Dark Arts classroom and hide. While there, they see Snape arrive and bring Lupin his potion and Lupin lock himself in his office. Harry suggests they just go talk to Lupin now, tell him everything 
something that's about to happen, but Hermione insists they can't be seen. They cannot risk it. Harry tries anyway, but Snape re-arrives right on cue to check on Lupin to make sure that the potion worked. At which point, Harry concedes to wait, but he doesn't have to wait long. Soon enough, they watch themselves arrive and have the entire interaction with Lupin. Harry can see scabbers across the room, immobilized and come to from the spell and start to run, but he's helpless to do anything. Moments later, everyone has left the room, Ron limping behind. Something just go out. This light, oh no. One of my lights died. But with everyone out of the room, they can now finally safely emerge and let Lupin out of his office. Remember, he was magically sealed in before, but they can undo it. And Lupin, for his part, doesn't even realize it's not the same Harry and Hermione he was just talking to. But they, being from the future, now know that Lupin is completely safe, and they quickly explain their plan to him and how he can help. Hermione goes with Lupin, but Harry decides to break off and insists he's going to try and stop Pettigrew from escaping. He picks up the dropped invisibility cloak, and before Hermione can even argue, he's after Sirius. Unseen by anybody else, Harry sneaks behind Pettigrew and waits for him to transform, ready to catch him. But as he does, he notices the Dementor attacking Sirius and himself. Where's the Patronus? Where's the Patronus? He wonders before realizing the truth. It was him. Expecto Patronum! He forgets Peter and instead conjures the stag, saving himself and Sirius, but Sirius is still taken captive. Meanwhile, up in the tower, Hermione and Lupin watch Dumbledore and Snape lock Sirius in the tower. Snape is of course extremely happy with the situation while Dumbledore looks mildly amused. After Dumbledore leaves Snape there to guard Sirius, Hermione sprints out of the hall screaming, Professor, help! Lupin pretends to chase her and Hermione pretends to fall down and get knocked out. Snape, of course, immediately recognizes Lupin and thinks he has come to free Sirius, not knowing the entire story himself. He immediately abandons his post and pursues Lupin through the castle. Hermione, of course, just then wakes up and let Sirius out, who immediately transforms and makes his escape. Snape naturally accuses Hermione of having let him out, but Dumbledore vouches for Hermione, claiming he himself found her unconscious body and brought her to the hospital wing. And there you go, just like that, Peter escapes, Sirius escapes, and Lupin is seen as a werewolf in the castle attacking a student, so he has to leave. But nonetheless, Harry learned the truth. Honestly, guys, when I start writing these, I have no idea how the story is going to unfold. I'm just sort of going one step at a time until we get to the end, and it has been so much fun, but it does take me so long to write them. So thank you so much for watching these. I hope you're enjoying them. Personally, I've really enjoyed how Draco's story seems to have been unfolding just three books in. It's like, who would have thought just spending so much consistent time around Harry would have made Draco a better person so much faster. But his slow coming around also I think really like thematically fits Prisoner of Azkaban, just very similar to how Sirius comes from this Slytherin pureblood family but disagrees with his family is kind of what Draco starts going through. But anyway guys, thanks again so much for watching. Don't forget to hit that bell and tune in next week for part four. What if Harry was in Slytherin, the Goblet of Fire? Seriously, if you want to see what Draco's Patronus is, you can check out this video right here. Or if you want to see another big seven part series like this, I would totally recommend Dumbledore's Big Plan by clicking right here. But otherwise, until next time, Ben, I will see you in the Life Brother.